Good morning, everyone. It is so good to be with you this morning. Uh, I'm just going to get myself situated here so that we are ready to go. All right. Um, like Pastor Ken said, my name is Kaylee, and I'm on the ministry team over at Beulah Alliance Church in Edmonton. And uh, I've been there just over two years now, and my role on the team is to oversee first steps within the church. And so what that means is basically whenever someone is new, uh, either myself or a volunteer gets to meet with them, and we learn about them and see how they're wanting to get connected, and then we track with them for a couple of months, make sure they're uh, settling in and feeling a part of the family over at Beulah. And the other part of my job, which is actually new to me as of the last couple months, is our new Christian follow-up process. And so I have the honor and the privilege of meeting with people that are new to faith, who have made the first time decision to follow Jesus, uh, and we match them up with a mentor, and we track with them for the first year of them being a Christian, uh, so that we can get them all caught up to speed, teach them the things they need to know, and support them uh, as they have made the biggest de decision they'll have ever made in their life. And so that's a little bit about myself and the role I play over at Beulah. And so um, Pastor Ken and I met, uh, I think it was back in May, so a couple months ago, about me coming and sharing with you guys this morning. Um, and I'm so excited that the day is here. I've been super psyched for the last couple of months, uh, just anticipating and just getting excited to be able to come and share with you. So I really do mean it when I say it is an absolute joy and a privilege to be able to share with you guys this morning. So thank you so much for your warm welcome and for having me. All right, so this morning we are going to be diving into the book of Ruth. Um, the, the book of Ruth is in the Old Testament, which is the first chunk of the Bible. Um, I personally love reading the Old Testament. Uh, it's full of so many uh, interesting and unique stories. Um, but what I love about it is that um, you can't read the Old Testament without looking at the New Testament. And you have to look at the Bible as an entire book. And so I know growing up, I always just thought that they were separate. I didn't really understand how they interacted. I just thought that was really old in the Old Testament and that the New Testament was newer. That's all I really knew growing up, um, but it, it is uh, a little bit different than that. And so if you want, you can open up your Bibles if you brought them. You can open up your phone app. You can turn to the book of Ruth. And if you don't have that, that's okay because we're going to go through the entire book and don't worry, we won't be here all day because the book of Ruth is only four chapters, so it is not very long. So you may have guessed it that the book of Ruth is about a lady named Ruth. Um, but there are also a bunch of other characters that we're going to learn about that is throughout this story. And so the book of Ruth starts, uh, opens with a lady named Naomi and her husband. And they live in Bethlehem. Um, but they decide to leave Bethlehem and move to a place called Moab uh, because there was a famine in the land, and so they move with their two sons to Moab to have a better life so that they can provide for their family. And so while they are there, uh, their two sons, they get married. They marry two Moabite women. One's name is Orpah, and the other's name is Ruth. And this is where the story takes a turn. So at this point, Naomi's husband passes away, as do her two sons, which leave the three women as widows. And so I'm not sure how much you know about Old Testament culture, but back then, women really had no ranking in society. If you weren't married, you couldn't really do anything. You, there was no way to work. You couldn't provide for yourself. And so you can imagine how desperate these women are feeling at this point, that it is just the three of them. There is no man there to help them. And so really, their only options at this point would have been to sit in the street and beg for food. They could maybe rely on a family member that might help them, or they'd have to resort to prostitution. And so at this point, they are in a really, they're in a really tough spot. And so Naomi comes up with a plan, and her solution to this is that they should all part ways and that they should all go back to their families, and that maybe they'll all take care of them. And so she tells her daughter-in-laws to go back, and maybe you can find a different husband and start a life for yourself, and I'm going to go on my own and go back to Bethlehem. And so this is where Orpah leaves. She goes back to her family, and uh, she leaves Ruth and Naomi. Naomi tells Ruth, you should go. Go back to your family. 
And Ruth refuses. And so when we take a look at Ruth chapter 1, verse 16, we're going to get a glimpse of just how determined Ruth was to stay with Naomi. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from where, to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. Can you imagine making a decision like Ruth's? Um, as I was thinking about this, I realized that Ruth could have just gone back to her family, to something that's familiar, to her own culture, to her own faith. Um, but instead, she chooses to commit her life to living without a husband, which means she really has no future. And she's committing to join another culture and to worship a God that is not her own. Has anyone ever been to a religious ceremony, maybe like a prayer service or a wedding that is outside of the Christian faith? A few of you? Yeah, there's a few of you. It's a really interesting experience, isn't it? it uh, is, it's usually a, a very unique experience. I remember in my first year of college, I had the opportunity to go and tour a mosque, which is a Muslim temple. And so that would be their equivalence of what we would view the church. Uh, and so I went with uh, a bunch of my friends from school and uh, it was very different from what I'm used to. I kind of thought like, it's gonna be like church. <laughs> It wasn't like church. It was a little bit different. Um, and and it, it was just different. It wasn't bad. It was just different. And, uh, and so I'm sure this morning you guys just got in your cars, came here. You probably came with family. Maybe you met up with some friends. And then you probably came with a coffee and visited for a bit and then picked a random seat and then waited for the service. That would be a pretty normal church experience for us, right? Um, and so when we, uh, when we went to the mosque, before we even got there, the people that... Um, that were taking us, they had told us that you need to dress really modestly. Um, both men and women needed to wear clothes that were looser fitting. You couldn't have anything that was tight or revealing. And so we all had to wear pants that were all the way down to our ankles, shirts all the way down. Uh, and then the women were asked to uh, cover their head before they entered uh, the temple. And so we did that out of respect for them and their culture. And so once we, uh, once we got there, we're in the parking lot, we have our, our modest clothing on, and uh, the women cover their head, and then uh, we couldn't bring in any food or drink, there was nothing allowed inside the temple, uh, and then once we, we got there, we had to take off our shoes, and so you weren't allowed to bring footwear inside the mosque. And then, so we get there, we go inside, and then at that point, uh, the men and the women weren't allowed to talk to each other anymore. And so the men got ushered into one side of the temple, and that's where all the men sat. And then the women got ushered to the other side. And then we had the really unique opportunity of observing a prayer service there. And so after the service was over, one of the temple leaders, they came up and they just explained to us a little bit about Islam and what they believe uh, and why they were doing this prayer service and the, the meaning of their prayers, why they pray, uh, and all of the significance behind the things they were doing. And so then uh, after that, we had uh, an opportunity to hang out and visit with some of the women that were uh, at the temple worshiping. And that was actually my favorite part of the whole experience because they were asking us, what is it like to be a Christian and uh, all of our different views? And we got to ask them, what is it like uh, to be a Muslim and all of that? And so that was probably my favorite part, just actually getting to connect with people um, that were there, that were just there to worship. And, uh, and so that was kind of the end of the tour. And as we were heading out, we were each given a Quran, which is um, their holy book. And so as Christians, we read and follow the teachings of the Bible. And for Muslims, they follow the uh, teachings of the Quran. So they each gave us one. And if you remember, we had to take our shoes off. And so as we we're leading, leaving, there's this girl beside me, and she put her Quran down on the shoe rack to then put her shoes on. Uh-oh, and, uh, uh -oh, and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and one of the women that we had been visiting with, she was on the other side of the room, she just gasped, and we all stopped, and she ran over, you guys, she didn't walk, like it was a run, and she ran over, and she picked up the book, and she started wiping it off, and all of us college students were just standing around, like we didn't know what was happening, 
Um, and she so graciously and patiently explained to us that they would never place the Quran down somewhere that is dirty or somewhere that is used to store our shoes. And, uh, and that was just so disrespectful because the book to them is holy and sacred. Uh, and so you can see it was a very different experience from what uh, I'm used to as a Christian going to a church service. Um, and I really enjoyed being able to take a few hours to learn about another faith and another culture. Um, but I, I can't ever imagine leaving my family and leaving a culture that I know and a God that I worship to join something that's completely different. And so that's what Ruth did. She decided to embrace the Jewish people. She decided to worship Yahweh, our God. She decided to uh, do that for the rest of her life. And she made that commitment to someone who could provide nothing for her in return. And so, at this point, Naomi and Ruth, they are back in Bethlehem, and Naomi is not doing okay. And so they get there, and a few women recognize her. They say, isn't that Naomi, the one that left for Moab? And this is how Naomi responds to them. She says, don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. And so at this point, it would be really easy for us to just skim over Naomi's words and their words in a book that's old. Um, but I think it's so important for us to take stock of the amount of despair that Naomi is in. That she originally left with her family to provide for them so that they could be in a land that wasn't experiencing famine. But now she's coming back with no husband, no kids. She has nothing. And so you might be wondering, what is the point of all of this? Why is Kaylee telling us something that's so sad? Why is she stirring up all of these emotions? And the point is, is because this isn't where the story ends. And this isn't where God leaves Ruth and Naomi. And I'm sure that some of us uh, here in this room have lost a spouse, have maybe lost a child, a family business, a means of providing. And any one of those would be so unimaginably difficult. And Naomi has to go through all of that. And so God doesn't just leave them on their own, but he provides for them someone in the Old Testament known as a kinsman redeemer. And so the kinsman redeemer um, is a concept in Jewish culture in the Old Testament. Um, and we first see this in Leviticus chapter 25. Um, Leviticus has a bunch of rules and laws that God gave for his people. And so the uh, we find a bunch of rules outlined for the kinsman redeemer. And a kinsman redeemer was normally a wealthy relative um, who would take responsibility for someone that was related to them that was in need or in danger uh, or facing hardship. And so some of the things that they were obligated to do um, would be to redeem a family member's land. So if they were losing the land, they would then have to go and buy that for them so they didn't lose it. Uh, they would redeem a family member that was enslaved. So if they were sold into slavery, it was their job to get them out. Uh, they were responsible for providing an heir if someone's husband passed away. That seems super strange in our, our culture today, but that is what was expected of them. And they were also expected to avenge uh, death. And so if someone was murdered, then it was their job to find the person that did it and bring justice to that. So as I said, Ruth and Naomi, they are back in Bethlehem, and Ruth decides to go into a field and follow behind the workers to pick up any scraps so that her and Naomi can have something to eat. And so it just so happens that Ruth chooses Boaz's field to work in, and she goes back that night and tells Naomi that she was able to work in a field, and she asks, whose field were you working in? And when she finds out, this is what Naomi says. She says, the Lord bless him, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law. He has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. She added, that man is our close relative. He is one of our guardian redeemers. So then Ruth goes back and she has this moment with Boaz where she tells him that she is related to Naomi and he is the, considered one of their kinsmen redeemers. 
And Boaz actually says that there is a relative who is actually uh, closer related that could be the one to help them. And so they go into town the next day to find this man, and he actually refuses to marry Ruth. He's willing to take the land, but not Ruth. And so he tells Boaz, you should be the one to redeem uh, this family. And so you should buy the land, you should marry Ruth. And that's what Boaz does. So he buys back the land, and he marries Ruth, and they have a son. And the story comes to a close in chapter 4. And it is uh, a scene of Naomi, and she's holding her grandson. And, oh, I just saw that. Oh, it's so nice. It has a happy ending, you guys. It is such a good story. Um, and, and it's just a picture of how Naomi's dignity has been restored. And she has thought that she lost her family, that she returned to this land empty-handed. But God has given her a new family and has given her a grandson, something that she thought she would never have. And so the women in the town who have been observing all of this, they say, Praise be to the Lord who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. And so the reason why I love the Old Testament is because this might just seem like a story, but it actually shows us so much about the heart of God and how he cares and loves us uh, to this day. And so like I said, we don't read the Old Testament without taking a look at the New Testament. And so we read the Bible as one big story. And the story of the Bible starts with God being separated from his people. And the rest of the Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament, is God filling in that plan to restore his people, to redeem them to himself. And he does that by sending Jesus. And so, by reading the book of Ruth, we see two women who end up in an extremely desperate situation, who then find redemption through a family member who's willing to help them with the things that they've lost and to restore dignity to both Ruth and Naomi. And this story is amazing because it points to what Jesus does for us today. Something that's really interesting throughout scripture is that uh, Jesus in the New Testament is compared to several people that are in the Old Testament. And so um, we find an example in 1 Corinthians, Jesus is referred to as the new Adam. So Adam as in Adam and Eve. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus is referred to as the new Moses. He is going to be the person that comes and redeems God's people and brings them out of slavery. In the Gospel of Mark, we see Jesus compared to the new David. And similar to these comparisons in the book of Ruth, we see Boaz as the kinsman redeemer. And in the New Testament, we see the Apostle Paul uh, equate Jesus to being our, <clears throat> excuse me, to being our redeemer. I have another question for you guys. Does anyone here speak more than one language? There's quite a few of you. Um, I personally only speak one language, and it would be English, as you could assume. It is my first and only language. Um, but uh, I'm sure that if you speak more than one language, you know that um, when you're trying to uh, explain something that maybe isn't in your first language, that in translation, meaning can get lost and that there can be moments where you're trying to think of an English word, and you can't quite find a word that has the same equivalence. Um, and so uh, my boyfriend, Josh, who's with me today, uh, he's Filipino, and his first language is Tagalog, and his second language is English. And one of my favorite things to do, Josh kind of hates this, uh, one of my favorite things to do is I'll be like, what is this word in Tagalog? Tell me. And then I'll be like, okay, now I'm going to try and say it. And he'll be like, you didn't say it right. I'll be like, okay, I'll try again. And so I've been building my vocabulary. And by building my vocabulary, I mean, I know like three words. And, um, <laughs> and one of my, and something that's just been so interesting um, has been sometimes I'll ask, what is this in Tagalog? And he'll say, I don't know. I actually don't know if there is a word for that. 
Um, or even vice versa, there will be things where uh, maybe we're with the rest of his family and I'll say, oh, like what, what were your parents talking about? Uh, and then I'll have to explain that there just isn't really an equivalence in Canadian culture for these different concepts or different cultural things. Um, and the Bible can be a little bit like that. It was written in uh, a different time, in a different culture, and in a different language. And so the Old Testament was actually written in Hebrew, and the New Testament was written in Greek. And so there have been scholars that have worked through the Bible who have studied the original languages and manuscripts. And so this Bible that I have here, this is an, an English NIV translation, uh, and it's called the translation uh, because it is the closest translation in English that we have to the Greek New Testament. And so uh, as I was preparing for this message, I was doing a word study and I want to share with you some of the things that I learned. And so if you want, you can turn to 1 Peter. We're going to be in chapter 1, verse 18, and this is going to, where we're going to be where we are camping out for the next little part. And so verse 18 says, For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life, handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ a lamb without blemish or defect. And so what I learned as I was going through the Greek of uh, this passage, I was looking at the word redeemed. And what I had learned is that the Greek word literally means to buy off or to be set free from the payment by the payment of a price. And so as I kept going, I kept digging, and I discovered that the root word for redemption in Greek is the word agora. And the word agora actually means marketplace. And so in Roman times, the marketplace was a space where uh, they would bring in slaves and they would be auctioned off. And people would come and they would offer different amounts of money and the person who would pay the highest price, the highest bidder, would receive that slave. Therefore, the word redemption declares that we have been bought with a price. Jesus bought us with the ultimate price, which was his life. It cost Boaz something to redeem Ruth and Naomi, and similarly, it cost Jesus something to redeem us out of slavery to sin and death. And so I'm going to read this passage for us one more time. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. You were bought with a price. You've been bought out of slavery to sin and death by something so priceless that no money could ever buy. And that's the blood of Jesus. That is how valuable you are to God. And so I just want to take a moment to let that sink in. I know that if you've been following Jesus for a while, that can almost just seem like a fact that you know. Um, but it's actually a truth that we get to live in every day. And so Boaz did for Ruth and Naomi what they couldn't do for themselves. He did for them what another person wasn't even willing to do for them. The first person rejected them. He said, I'm not willing to take that on. I'm not willing to do that. So Jesus has redeemed us in a way that no human ever could. And he brings so much meaning to our lives. In the passage, it talks about being handed down an empty way of life. And so Jesus brings so much meaning to our lives that no person and no amount of money and no measure of success ever could. And so maybe this is something that's new to you. Maybe this is your first time in church and you're like, whoa, I don't know what she's talking about. They're talking about blood and all these crazy things. Um, and so maybe this is your first time hearing about Jesus as your redeemer and someone who is there to save you. And if that's you, um, there's going to be an opportunity near the end to come up for prayer. Uh, if that, even if you just have a question, there's no pressure. You don't have to make a decision today or anything like that. But just to, if you are curious or you have a question, uh, I'll be down at the front. I know Pastor Ken will be as well and a few other people at the end of the service. And so if that's you, make sure you don't leave today without, without talking to someone. It can just be a question. If you want to make that decision, we'd love to talk with you and pray with you. 
And maybe you've been following Jesus for a while, and you know him as your redeemer. And that's awesome. That's amazing. But you might also be in the midst of a situation like Naomi's that feels impossible. Naomi knew and loved and worshipped God, yet her husband still passed away. Her sons passed away. She thought she was left with nothing. And the kind of funny thing is when you become a Christian, life doesn't get easier. It gets harder. But yet God is there because he's our redeemer, because he has paid a price for us. He's bought us out of slavery to our sin and to death. And so I just want to read this verse one more time for you guys. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. Jesus truly is our redeemer. And you've been bought with a price because that's how much Jesus loves you. That's how much God loves you. And so like I said, if that's something that's new to you and you would like to chat with someone, if you'd like to be prayed for, there's going to be opportunity near the end. If you feel like you're in one of those impossible situations like Naomi, I would also love to pray for you. And don't be shy. Um, I'm usually the person that's shy. I'm like, should I go up? Should I not? I don't know. Like, is it a need? I don't know. Like, should I do it? You should do it. If you feel like you could use some prayer, everyone can use prayer. And so if that is you, uh, we would love the opportunity to just spend some time praying with you.